good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs> um, I am Lauren Strant, joined with uh, Mark Powney, um, and today we're going to be taking you through the tech that actually made this conference possible. Um, so before we get started, I um, want to thank our lovely sponsors that have made our job a lot easier. No, actually, no, they haven't made our job a lot easier. They've assisted in our job. It's still been a very hard slog, as you're about to find out. Um, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this online conference is hosted, and the traditional custodians of the land where our Australian-based speakers, us, um, and participants are located. We would also like to pay our respects to the elders past, present, and future. Uh, we have a lovely code of conduct. Um, this is our last day of the conference, so all bets are off. No, still have a code of conduct. Um, <laughs> in the short, the really short version is be nice to each other. So you can find that code of conduct online. Um, and I'm going to let Mark introduce himself. G'day. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Powney. I am uh, currently a cloud architect at Engage Squared. Um, I am also on Twitter, as you can see there by uh, this slide. Uh, but basically, my role here was to provide some uh, really good tech to uh, to make this month long event work. Uh, so a lot of my involvement in the in the event was uh, behind the scenes. I did produce a couple of sessions here and there, but um, yeah, it was really uh, a good experience to get involved with the M365 team and uh, and make uh, a difference to, to make this unique circumstances, I guess, that we're in uh, really, really work. And um, so hopefully today will be enlightening for those sort of that are uh, listening to us. Um, and perhaps uh, we should take this point as well for questions through oh, yes. the, the the call uh, through the uh, through this particular session. Um, we have the lovely lovely Bex uh, producing us today, and she will keep an eye on any uh, questions that come through the Q and A section of the live event. Of course, if you look for the live event uh, Q and A section on the on the screen that you see there in Microsoft Teams. Uh, you'll be able to uh, post a question there. Uh, we'll try and address them maybe towards the end, I think would, would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it, uh, Lorraine? Certainly would. Um, so I guess people will see the full picture there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so a bit about me. Um, I am Lorraine Strant. Um, I also have my socials and other bits and pieces up there. Um, I'm product manager at Instinct Technology, where I live and breathe teams, but I also I do that outside because um, that's just really my passion is helping people communicate and collaborate and work together. So um, yeah, I am one of the co-organizers. Um, Mark and I have known each other for a number of years, but never really worked together like this before. And basically Mark was brought in because we needed help with some web stuff and we didn't actually know what that was. Web um, stuff. <laughs> but um, lo and behold, my job. <laughs> it turned out to be a bigger thing. So yeah. Um, <laughs> So in terms of how we're going to break this up, what we want to take you through first is, I guess, setting the scene. So what was the event version one um, and what um, what we ended up with event version two? Um, so the first thing is um, event V1, which was an M365 Saturday, just a regular full day event. Um, you know, what did it look like? We were planning on yeah, just having a single day event, um, having probably about 15 to 20 speakers. Uh, across a variety of topics. We did actually want it to be not completely tech, so we wanted it actually to have a little bit of business and people-based stuff as well. Uh, we estimated we'd probably have 100 to 150 attendees because it is a Saturday. Um, and yeah, it was effectively going to be run at a training center, not a, a boring drab training center. We actually were planning to have it at um, a lovely Clifton's training center in Melbourne. It's actually quite modern and has really um, great vibe about it. Um, and so that was the original plan. Um, so what we needed for that to, to occur was we already had a meetup going from previous iterations of this, um, of this event. So we needed a meetup to manage the registration and who was actually attending. Um, we, we started to use Sessionize, which is something that was new to us um, in terms of collecting um, speakers. So getting speaker submissions, building out uh, the schedule. Um, I know that some other events have tried to use Microsoft Forms and spreadsheets. Um, and while we did actually discuss internally, you know, should we just use the out of the box things because it's an M365 event? It's like, yes, but sometimes it's better to just use an off the shelf purpose built tool instead of trying to 
you know, hack something together ourselves. Um, we also are going to use spsevents.org as the landing page. So spsevents.org is effectively a customized WordPress installation that is used for um, SharePoint um, Saturday events, hence the SPS. Um, but it's obviously used for a lot more things. So when you go on there, you actually see a huge listing of, of M365 and SharePoint-esque events from around the world. So it's a great place to get our um, page listed there. Uh, and obviously we're going to use Microsoft Teams to run the organization side of things. Um, so as we were getting through the, you know, probably early on into the planning, we were starting to build out what would our day look like? And we actually had a date picked out and we're about to start going to speakers. And uh, we actually started getting, um, sorry, sponsors. And we actually had already started getting speakers uh, to submit some sessions. We probably had about, uh, probably about five or seven sessions in there. Um, this little thing happened called COVID-19, uh, which changed things dramatically. And pretty early on, we went, you know what, we have to pivot and make this an online event um, because we just felt, even if at the point at that time, we didn't have uh, any lockdown orders, we just thought, look, in the interest of public safety, um, let's not create an event that some people might not come to or that assists in the spread. So we thought, okay, let's make it an online event, simple, easy, um, well, so, so we thought. So what did that look like? So we changed it because we already had planned to run our M365 Saturday in May. It was actually planned for May the 9th. Um, we thought, okay, what does, what does an online event look like? So we thought, okay, yeah, look, let's make it a month long event. What harm can that be? It's gonna be pretty <laughs> simple. Um, we're what could at, go uh, wrong? <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, actually nothing really went wrong. It's just, no. we probably didn't expect it to have as much take up as it did. So. Yeah, we went from having about 10 to 15 speakers to about 105 speakers um, because obviously now scheduling was no longer an issue. So people that didn't previously want to speak on a Saturday were now able to speak because basically you could choose whenever you wanted. Um, what it also meant for us as organizers was um, we didn't have to be as selective about sessions as we might have had to have been when we had a solid window of eight hours. Um, on a Saturday, it meant that we could actually be more open to people that didn't really have speaking experience or weren't known to the community or us. Um, and so we're allowed to let, you know, have more first timers so they could you know, cut their teeth effectively and bring more of the community into it. Um, yeah, we kind of went from having, you know, 100 to 150 attendees to 2000 plus attendees um, and registration. So it's yeah, just a small jump in numbers. And while originally this was going to be an M365, um, Saturday event in Melbourne. Um, we still kept the speakers to being Australian and New Zealand speakers with the exception of sponsors. Um, however, um, this has turned into having a global attendance with people from all over the world. Um, so, and obviously we, we um, set it to run online. So what did we need? So um, our event registration system, we went from meetup.com to eventbrite.com, um, largely because Eventbrite is more about ticketing as opposed to just, uh, and just simple registration, as opposed to meetup, which is more about community building um, and regular interactions. Um, we kept Sessionize for speaker management um, because it was a great platform. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's interesting to, to to draw on Sessionize as well, because as, as someone sort of looking in from the outside, uh, there were some interesting capabilities of, of Sessionize, right, that 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 uh, were really helpful regardless of which uh, which technology, uh, sorry, which, yeah. which platform or format that we use, right? So yes. um, the, the thing that I saw most uh, uh, valuable in Sessionize is the way that the call for speakers works and the triaging of that. Um, I mean, uh, as you said, we we uh, the the event was opened up to a lot more speakers, but that triaging process that Sessionize offers to uh, allow speakers to submit uh, and and then offers the event coordinators the ability to review those uh, sessions uh, in a in a pretty coherent way, like with a with a whole like process behind it. And that's that's the difference because you, you you talked before about uh, using forms and Excel uh, that would have to be built manually, right? That sort of that yeah. triaging process. Whereas Sessionize is like a pre-built, it's perfect, it's 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 designed exactly for for a for a, an event system, right? Yeah. And actually, though, I had never heard of it before until um, I saw a call for speakers 
for um, M365 Saturday in Nashville that a friend of uh, my Dan, uh, Daniel Glenn was organizing. I was like, oh, what is this? I've seen the URL before, but I've never actually gone to it. Um, had a look on the website. It is actually a commercial tool for organizing speakers um, and conference agendas, not just you know these kind of events. Um, but luckily it is actually free for community events. Um, and so because we weren't planning on charging for this um, conference, that made it a lot easier. So um, as Mark said, it's it's an off the shelf solution that allowed us to effectively just go, right, okay, here's our call for speakers page um, and to build a schedule. And it was just a lot easier than having to try and use the tools um, or build something ourselves. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, what we used instead of spseventsorg we could have continued to use it, but the reality is, as I said, it was a WordPress site. Um, I didn't particularly like the long URL that we were given, um, because if you think about it, it was spseventsorg slash M365 Melbourne 2020, so it was a bit of a mouthful. Um, and so even though we could have had a redirect, it still wasn't exactly a pretty URL. So Given that um, SPS Events was built on WordPress, just a customized version, um, and it was using things like Eventbrite and Sessionize plugins um, to surface those in the page, I thought, sure, we can do this ourselves. Um, <laughs> the reality is SPSEvents.org didn't actually really um, add much more other than it was an off-the-shelf template for running an event site. Um, and, and the important so thing is, as well with WordPress is it is a content management system, right? So. Yep. Uh, in, its, in its very basic form, it's it's an ability for anyone uh, with basic editing uh, skills to go in and update a page, to put content there. Uh, you know, the messaging around what the event is all about uh, is really easy to update for anyone, which is exactly what a content management system is good for, right? Um, yeah. uh, it just and happens I to be that this is the plain ordinary WordPress as opposed to the SPS events uh, yes. version of it. And look, I already, I've been using WordPress for a number of years. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I'm comfortable with it. Um, and I've also got a web hosting set up um, where I can just, doesn't really cost me any extra to um, to just spin up another website on it. Um, so, and then obviously we still use Microsoft Teams as you can see now by joining a Teams Live event, um, but it became vastly different. Instead of just Teams being used for our organization, um, it became for organization. It, it came used for a speaker community and obviously the presentation platform. Um, so the challenge we had is that something was missing. Um, so yes, we had um, Sessionize, um, and, but the reality is Sessionize was built for an in-person event and a single week, which we rapidly found out because when you um, create a session um, plan with Sessionize, you have the options of like, what room is it? And the ability to change rooms, but there was nowhere for us to put a URL in for um, an online event. Um, also, what we found is when we started to surface it, yes, you can actually have multi-day or you could have, it certainly supported um, having a month-long event in there, but it didn't um, It didn't give us the ability to, well, it didn't display the data really well because it wasn't designed to show multiple weeks. It was designed really for one, you know, to have a Tuesday, not four Tuesdays. Yeah, um, and the interesting sort of aspect of that is the, uh, particularly like the difference between the admin side versus the uh, what uh, Sessionize gives to a user who might be trying to attend uh, an event like this is quite stark. Like the admin side from this perspective worked really well. You could, you know, drag uh, meetings around to different locations, you know, different times of the, the, the week and the month that you're working with. But then when we're trying to display it back out to users, uh, that's where it fell down, right? So Absolutely. there was this weird sort of tag mechanism for for dates. Uh, you know, so yeah. when when an attendee wanted to choose which date they're looking at, they they didn't get a, a nice date picker or anything. They were kind of like clicking on tags, and they were really weirdly sorted and all sorts yep. of sort of oddities, which which would have worked very well for uh, reasonably well for a for a uh, in person event uh, that might have yep. just worked for a day. But because we are, we expanded this out to a month long, that's where we kind of found the, the discrepancy, right? Absolutely, and I think actually to that point, because um, this was a month long event, we had a lot more flexibility, uh, but also a requirement for um, scheduling flexibility. Um, and so where Sessionize is again designed for an in-person event, it's effectively um, a captive audience from a speaker perspective. The speakers are generally there at the event across those days, so you can create the session, but. When we're doing a month-long event, we do have people who can't be 
be available for certain days. So mm -hmm. it didn't really allow us to do that. Um, we also needed the ability to change um, from live events to meetings on the spot, um, which is something that we really couldn't do. So ultimately what we needed to provide attendees such as yourselves was a single URL for people to navigate to. Um, what this allowed us to do is to have less communication um, around changes. So we didn't want to have to send out uh, an email to every single attendee going, hey, this URL has changed for this event today because mm. a lot of people wouldn't care. Uh, yeah. We also didn't want to have to send daily updates out um, or even weekly updates out and bombard people with, hey, here's all the URLs for this. Um, we've, we've done that for important ones, but we didn't want to have to do it every day. Um, we also wanted people to be able to add the sessions to their Outlook calendar, which is something I think was probably the first cab off the rank. Mark and I talked about how do we build like an ICS based system for this. Um, and we also wanted the ability to, to have the schedule available without actually us having booked in the live event URL, because if you have gone to schedule live events in Teams, um, it's not a complex process, but it's a number of clicks. Um, and gave me serious RSI when I was doing them in batches. So I wanted to do them a week at a time, not you know, 100 plus sessions, 130 sessions in one go. Yeah. Um, and, and on that point as well, and it goes back to the previous uh, dot you, you, you mentioned was uh, we didn't, we weren't restricted or didn't want to be restricted just to Teams live events, right? We could, we wanted to be able to uh, deliver a session through other means, um, I think, uh, for seen. example, the the weekly uh, the weekly wrap up sessions are done on YouTube, YouTube because yeah. it's a, a live, uh, uh, publicly available and recorded option. Um, so and and there are even other uh, apps that we, yeah. <laughs> we we may not wish to mention so much, but we're used for one or two sessions throughout the <laughs> throughout the event as well, right? No, well, no, there was no Zoom. People did ask oh, right, us if yes. we would do Zoom, but I kind of put the foot down and said, no, this is a Microsoft 365 event. We're not going to use competing tools. Um, so behind the scenes, um, uh, you know, the kind of technologies we did use were post-it notes, um, which despite the fact we used Sessionize, um, we needed a way to be able to um, be able to build the themes and figure out how we're going to lay things out um, in a big picture. So uh, yeah, we needed that visualization and that took Megan, uh, Rebecca and myself uh, a solid, I think about four hours on a Saturday um, of the three of us working at the same time it was grueling. Um, we still then used, obviously, as I said, um, session eyes for the speaker and um, session submission management. Also the approval and communication process. We did actually reject a few sessions because there were speakers outside of the US or not related to M365. So there was a few pure D365 sessions. So I'm not related at all. Create the schedule. Um, Azure, which is the, the magic that stuck everything together that Mark will talk about um, in a bit more. Um, obviously we still had WordPress and that gave us the ability to surface the um, sessions. While Sessionize does have um, a plugin for WordPress, it wasn't displaying what we wanted and for some reason not chronologically, which was just weird, but um, that was a challenge. Um, also Eventbrite, we, there's a plugin for WordPress, so we're able to embed that, embed that in front and center. Um, and then obviously Microsoft Teams um, live events. We learned a lot from using live events. Um, a lot of stuff that is not documented. Uh, people may see it as a bug, but it's actually just, it's logical. It's just not documented clearly. Um, and we also had, um, uh, yeah, I guess the speakers were able to communicate with each other as well. Um, we did contemplate, um, having speak having attendees in a team as well uh but as the amount of registrations increased and i saw the amount of speakers i went no chance in hell am i having that many people come into my tenant um because it's running out of my personal tenant um and it wasn't about i'm um, secure or anything it was just the amount of support and administration required to support this and to be honest after seeing how much support and uh was required for 3000 mvps um, to attend a Microsoft MVP summit via Teams. I was like, no, I can't do this for end users because if MVPs yeah. have some challenges, end users will have more. I think I think lowering the barrier as, as, as low as we can for attendees is really important, right? We don't yeah. want to have to require them to sign in with a, with a Microsoft account um, or any of that sort of uh, yep. uh, mayhem. 
uh, not mayhem. It's actually not a bad uh, yeah. solution. It's very flexible now, and it, uh, Azure Active Directory is a very, uh, <laughs> it's got you know, B to Z and B to B and all the rest of it, and there's, there's a lot of capability in there. But, uh, you know, it's all about making sure that we want to um, open this event up to all who, who, who want to attend. Uh, I think we even went to the point where, I mean, if you're viewing this now, you didn't necessarily have to log in to anything, right? You didn't have to mm. provide. Uh, you might you might have a, a entered in your name to the to the team's um, you know anonymous screen, uh, but that's about it. Uh, yep. And that's sort of I think that's important. Um, yeah, we wanted to, a friction to make it as experience. smooth as possible. Yeah, yeah. And I think the the challenge we also would have had with teams as we had with some speakers is that my tenant is actually quite secure because of the nature of work that I do, um, the NDA stuff that I've got in my tenant, and also the fact that for my for me to be able to connect to the Microsoft.com tenant from my tenant. I have to maintain a certain level of security um, and we already found that other people's tenants when they were trying to connect to mine were less secure and it would just reject them and there was nothing I could do to correct that um, without breaking my own stuff and so that just was a challenge that we didn't want to have to introduce at a mass level. Yeah. Um, so this is the uh, the the uh, most advanced technology we had which was the post <laughs> notes that's uh, Rebecca who's our lovely producer today. Um, I really like this the, I really like this picture because it it, it, it's quite artistic in a sense. It kind of reminds me of a conductor in front of a, an orchestra, uh, you know, going nuts trying to coordinate everything at one time. And that's a, that's a really yeah. apt way to describe what we're trying to do here. And I, I think the reason why I wanted to have this slide on there was um, my view of technology in general, and I'm sure, Lauren, you, you share the same uh, point of view, is that it's not always software. It's not always hardware that that makes things work. Mm -hmm. um, there's some elements to this uh, post-it note, post-it notes approach that is really flexible, right? You, you've got some. Uh, I mean, you can see there the the post-its are kind of the title of the uh, the session. There might be some little bits of information about who who's uh, who who's running that that particular session. Uh, it's, and you can just add and remove stuff like that very easily. Where if you did that sort of thing on on in an online system, someone would have had to code that up. So I think there's yeah. there's some really valuable valuable sort of insights into how we can use technology in in inverted commas uh, inverted quotes um, to deliver or to to figure out certain aspects of of this type yeah. of event. And what was uh, also not visible in this particular screenshot as well. Um, Bex was doing this stuff. Megan and I were both sitting um, in the study where I am right, right now um, with our laptops open across multiple windows because we also had um, the spreadsheet open with the submissions. We had calendars open. We also had another listing open um, that where speakers put in their times that they could and couldn't do and then some people got the instructions wrong. So we had to decode that and so yeah, we had about probably five screens running with different bits of content information on them and then yeah, to make this work. So um, at this point, what we're going to do is bring up the competition slide, which is also gives Mark an opportunity to transition over to his content um, yeah. without us taking it down. Um, um, so. Yeah, so I guess uh, it's uh, and hopefully I'm sharing that screen now. Um, uh, where are we? There we go. Uh, yeah, it's a good opportunity. Uh, obviously, the competition is uh, what uh, is a way for us to thank you for joining us in this event as well. So if you scan that QR code, you can uh, uh, enter yourself in to win uh, the prize for week five. Uh, and the prize rules are obviously up on the M365May website at that address. Um, but yeah, we did talk about technology, and there's obviously a, an aspect of technology that is um, that is uh, you know post-it notes, and it's a great great way to use physical technology, so to speak. But also, when I'm when you look at things from a developer's point of view, to start thinking about how you want this to to work in a uh, in a, a, a software sense. So my first um, consideration when I when Lauren sort of came to me and said, hey, we want to put this online and et cetera, et cetera, was, OK, I need to make sure that this this uh, solution scales and, you know, it's very likely that we deliver this solution with um, Azure because uh, we want to be in the Microsoft ecosystem. So I looked at different stacks and 
um, as a developer, we often think about stacks, right? So when I first started as a web developer, you know, two decades ago, I was thinking about, okay, I, I use the, uh, what's called the LAMP stack, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP for a lot of my web development. Uh, it was actually a stack before it was, before the term stack was uh, around. Uh, stacks of different natures are, are available these days. And the one that um, I, I find most interesting today, particularly for cloud-based uh, solutions, uh, for, for web-based solutions, is the Jamstack model. And what that is, is a, a way to use different technologies or to a, a sort of a conceptual way to use different technologies to um, separate the uh, relevant parts. So. Uh, Jamstack is a, uh, an abbreviation for JavaScript, APIs, and markup. And it's a really good separation of logic. So when it comes to JavaScript, for example, we use Node.js. And Node.js is a great ecosystem of, of supporting libraries. Um, if you're familiar with NuGet or those other sort of library package managers, uh, Node.js has its own and it's a, 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 a very, has a very wide range of, of libraries to support um, whatever it is that you want to do. And JavaScript is great for rendering of a user interface. So when uh, we're browsing through the M365 May site and we want to find the sessions, uh, JavaScript is, is a great technology to uh, perform all that work. And it's also on the browser, so it's not impacting any server-side infrastructure. Uh, you just have to deliver it out to your uh, users and your users' computers will be the thing that, that processes everything. Then we've got the API layer. Now, obviously, any uh, site like this, we need to provide data. We also need to provide uh, an authentication mechanism for management of that data as well. And that that's well suited to an API layer that is the A in Jamstack. So in this case, we decided to use Azure Function Apps, uh, which again is well suited to the Microsoft ecosystem. And um, I've, it, it's a really straightforward uh, uh, mechanism. The amount of code, the, the, the amount of code that you need to uh, implement to get an Azure Function App up and running is very minimal. The boilerplate code for it is, is very minimal. You just get straight to the point and say, okay, I want to provide this data. Where do I get it from? Write that bit of code. How do I deliver it out? What sort of format? Write that bit of code and it's done. So in this sense, it was a very uh, good uh, API layer for, um, for a low code solution, I, I, would, I would say. And finally, uh, for the markup side, which is the M in, in Jamstack, uh, we, we just went with WordPress. Now, other implementations of Jamstack that, you know, it's been a sort of a stack that's been around for a good, um, uh, since I think 2011 was when it was first coined by a company called Netlify. Uh, markup is simply the, the bit that sort of tells the browser, you know, I, this is a page uh, and it might be a single page, it might be multiple pages. But there's there's a markup element to it because we already had a content management system in m365may.com uh we we thought okay let's let's stick to wordpress as delivering that markup side of things uh, but pretty straightforward there but to go into a bit, a bit more detail about what each of those uh, uh areas of the jamstack model look like for this solution i'll start with the javascript side of things so I mentioned before, Node.js was the development environment that the JavaScript aspects were delivered in. And Node.js is very well um, adopted across the community. Uh, you know, I, I, my day job is uh, SharePoint framework development, or uh, soon it won't be called SharePoint framework. It'll be probably Microsoft framework or something similar. But it's, it's very much part of the Microsoft development ecosystem now is to uh, write code in Node.js. Um, so, and that was, as I said, it's a great uh, ecosystem of packages. So as a developer, I don't need to develop things from scratch anymore. I can uh, call upon a whole bunch of libraries that are available through uh, Node.js 
and say if I want date handling, which is quite important for this uh, this uh, display of sessions for m365may.com. Um, I can just call upon a library. Uh, there's there's a couple of different libraries. Some are more fully fledged than others. Some are bigger. Some, but there's there's a there's a great ecosystem available to me, so I can choose the right tool for the job. So I chose uh, a bunch of libraries to to deliver this in. Uh, the first one is a framework called React, um, and React is uh, again it's it's adopted by Microsoft in a lot of the uh, capability that you see in Office 365 um, or Microsoft 365 as it's now referred to. Uh, you know SharePoint Online, the UI elements to that is all uh, is all built in React, uh, and also. The next library that I chose to use is built on top of it, or there's a there's a series of components built on top of React, and that's called the Fluent UI. Um, so if you, uh, and it might not be easy to see on this slide, but the the date picker here, I might even try to bring it up on um, in a web browser. Uh, so if I go to the sessions page on uh, on m365may.com. You can see here these components, this date picker. I didn't write that from scratch. I just used the Fluent UI date picker. And it's great because it's it's mobile friendly. Uh, it's, it's, it's accessible. Uh, there's a whole bunch of built-in stuff and I don't have to worry about it. I just jump, put it on a page and uh, wire it up to interact with the other elements of the page and, and it all just works. Um, and you know, even this uh, this drop down box here for for speakers, that's that's all offered through the Fluent UI uh, uh, library that's uh, open sourced by Microsoft. Another library that we use with the uh, Microsoft Authentication Library. So behind the scenes, and uh, attendees wouldn't have seen this, but definitely the organisers, uh, uh, Lauren, yourself, uh, Bex, and uh, Megan. Uh, and and Daryl, uh, who was our video producer extraordinaire, um, we all used a an admin interface that needed to be authenticated. Obviously, we didn't want anyone just adding their own URLs and sessions into the system. So we used the Microsoft Authentication Library, which again is a library that's open sourced by Microsoft, and we can just plug it in and very quickly authenticate to um, to uh, the the, the the function apps that uh, the API way that we're gonna uh, that, I'll, that I'll talk through in the next slide, uh, and of course, to bring this all together, we had to define the user interface. So um, you can see there, there's actually uh, three entry points that we uh, needed. Uh, the most prominent of which, uh, probably the most used, is the session listing page. And again, that's that that page when you browse to the site. Uh, this is the, the session listing page. Another entry point that um, is uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, or I've lost my mouse for a moment. Well, let me just get that back. Um, is the session details page, which is another entry point. So uh, I could browse directly to a session details page. So we had to design what that looks like. You'll notice that the um, the uh, the display of a session here is very similar to the display of the session listing page and that's because react is a componentized model and it's exactly the same component that's in place for um for the session listing page is used for the session details page so it's again a great react is a great sort of way to reuse components throughout your interface and of course one last um thing to consider is the uh, the speaker profile. So when you click on a speaker like that, you can see there there's um, speakers being displayed in their profile picture and so forth. Uh, really great sort of um, component to this. So that was the, the JavaScript layer. Um, another element to that, which again was something behind the scenes, which um, if I just uh, get the right screen up, then you can see here we've got a, a listing of all of the sessions and this is all authenticated. So if I um, I can, I need to sign in to gain access to this and this is where we enter in 
the um, the uh, URL of the event that we're choosing. And once a video has been produced by Daryl, uh, he will enter in the URL of that uh, that video as well. And we can even um, adjust this to to change how soon or how early people will be let into that event URL, which is really really handy, I think, for um, uh, as an option for the coordinators team. So that was the, the JavaScript layer. Uh, the next one was the API side of things. So out of that Jamstack uh, stack, uh, we had the API. And in total, we've come to 25 functions. So I talked about low, low code solution. Uh, it's not no code solution. We did actually have to wire this up to get data out of Sessionize. And the great thing about Sessionize was they do provide an API to uh, see all the sessions. So all the scheduling that happened before I commenced this, this piece of work, that was all reusable. I could just grab that data and provide it in the way that made sense for the uh, m365may.com site. Uh, and that was through a series of uh, uh, Azure functions uh, there are actually 25 functions in total. And you can see there that I, I've roughly categorized them into what they did. So from an attendee's perspective, they were most interested in the calendar, um, the ability to, to load a, a, an invite into their own calendar. Uh, they were most interested in seeing what the session details were. Uh, also the click approach. So you notice if you um, click on uh, uh, the view live event or uh, if you click on the uh, view video button on each of the session uh, listing pages that sends you through uh, a click handler or a request response handler uh, and that's that's the glue that sort of made sure that we could always update live events uh, you know right up to the minute so if something changed, and I, I think it happened once or twice where uh, we we wanted to change an event from a live event like what we're watching now, which is all very um, sort of, you know, we've got presenters and we've got a Q&A section, but we don't have much interaction with each other. Uh, we wanted to change in one or two um, sessions that to a, to a Teams meeting. And so having that click functionality to always triage or, or send the user to, to the right location was quite important for, for this solution. We're also doing some analysis of those clicks. So behind the scenes, when you click on that event uh, or that button, it's uh, taking your IP address, for example, and it's looking up where you're, roughly where you're located with a free, um, uh, IP address lookup system. Uh, so that's that's built into into the into the Azure functions as well. Uh, we're obviously not keeping any more than what's important for uh, GDPR reasons or, or you know global sort of privacy standards. But we we were interested in where people are coming from, and uh, you know what um, uh, what sort of locations uh, people are using to or coming from to to click on events. Some of the other APIs that we built here uh, are for data export. So to make this as efficient as possible, uh, this whole solution, instead of every data request for a session to be um, to hit an API, uh, which has a cost in Azure Functions, you know, there's a there's a processing cost to each API hit, where actually the data isn't changing that much. Uh, when it when it gets returned, um, we thought it's better to to design this solution to export that data out in its pure form of JSON and offer it as content through a, a, a CDN instead. And that that worked really well. We we do that on a on an hourly basis. That could be decreased to be say every fifteen minutes or whatever. But we built some functionality or some sort of efficiencies into. The, um, the API to, to make it uh, as, as quick as possible. And there were two benefits to that. We, A, we weren't consuming Azure Function uh, uh, serverless capability, uh, and B, we're um, delivering that through a CDN. So uh, the from the user's perspective, the 
response time dramatically increased, uh, you know, from uh, maybe uh, like a second or so of response time down to milliseconds um, because it was all through uh, delivered through a CDN. And of course, from the API perspective, that uh, user interface that I saw that's built on JavaScript needs to offer um, uh, a series of APIs that are authenticated. You must uh, provide a, a, an OAuth uh, authentication token to them uh, for all the admin functions. And that's the ability to update and um, change uh, uh, session details, the URLs and the, the, um, the number of minutes before it's open and that sort of thing. So that's a good description of the two main components to this, the JavaScript component, the API component. Now I'm I'm very much in the Microsoft ecosystem and the ecosystem now uh, uh, from a developer's point of view, now a very big part of that is GitHub. Um, and so what I needed to do is, is figure out a way to deliver this source code out to out to the um, out to users, uh, sorry, out to the environment that we're delivering to. And so we use GitHub for source code hosting. And at the time we used Azure DevOps to perform the pipelines, the build and deployment pipelines for, um, for getting the code out to our Azure services. Um, there's GitHub Actions uh, are also available and we could have kept it all within GitHub itself instead of separating the two, having Azure DevOps do the pipelines. But I think that um, it's one of the things about the, you know, the way that uh, the development ecosystem that's made available through through Microsoft Technologies now is, is really great is this uh, sort of uh, interoperability. And sure, GitHub might be owned by Microsoft now and Azure DevOps is obviously owned by Microsoft, but the underlying hooks to enable that interoperability um, still exist and you know, you can use another solution for um, for pipeline and a delivering of code out to out to the services. Uh, in fact, before GitHub was um, purchased by Microsoft, uh, uh, it would be commonly used. Uh, Circle CI would be one of the uh, 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 continuous integration tools that that would often be used with GitHub, and that was a third party tool, right? And it worked really well, and everyone was uh, very much. Um, uh, has been very much involved in that. But there's new developments in GitHub and GitHub Actions is probably where we, we, we could have uh, used to, to deliver this code as well. I thought I'd take this opportunity as well, and I know we're, we're sort of running out, out of time, but some of the challenges that uh, we encountered along, along the way that we needed to solve. Uh, just to sort of, you know, peek behind the curtain, it wasn't all rosy colored uh, well, uh, rose gardens and sunshine. Um, uh, the first one that we encountered was the Sessionize API limits. And I think this is important for any uh, online uh, service like Sessionize. Um, you need to impose some limits on your customers to ensure that your services don't get overused, that you don't have, in, <laughs> you don't induce your own costs that, that are unexpected. And Sessionize has an API limit of 100 calls per, I think it was 100 calls per minute. And that that was um, important to consider because some sessions, and we didn't really know, but some sessions had more than 100 attendees. So if you can imagine that we had uh, more than 100 people hitting the service uh, at a, um, you know, to get onto an event, uh, if we hit that limit, we would have, um, we would have ended up having to reject some, some users. Uh, and it probably would have just errored and not really dealt with it well. So we we put a, the Azure Functions layer in front of it to to handle those in a more uh, efficient manner. One of the other challenges we had was iframes versus JavaScript embedding. So to get this into the m365may.com site, um, you may have noticed originally if you you started attending some of the sessions early on. Uh, there were sometimes scroll bars displayed and we tried to do our best to, to get rid of those, but they were sometimes there. And that was because it was an iframe uh, based solution uh, to get it into the m365may.com site. Um, 
that was an easy way to, to get it in. iframes are really easy to, to implement, but there are security considerations to, to, uh, to make when, when doing that. And so we moved it over to a JavaScript embed approach, which is um, uh, far, like far easier to control. Uh, and that happened throughout the uh, event. I think it was about week two that I implemented that. I can't remember. Uh, other issues that were challenges that we had to deal with was cause or cost or origin resource sharing. Uh, we had to make sure that all sites could talk to each other from a browser's point of view because we had content coming from a, a, a CDN, a, 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 the API, uh, sorry, the JavaScript layer was coming from a CDN, uh, but the, con the, the site itself was from m365may.com, so there's cause uh, rules that we needed to implement there. And Azure makes it very easy to configure that, by the way, you just have to configure it. Repeated data calls, I referenced this before, so when we had the same data being sent out multiple times, we wanted to move that off uh, Azure Functions because there is a consumption cost that's uh, relatively high there. Uh, instead, we uh, we wanted to generate that as JSON data and offer it as a, as a CDN uh, uh, delivered uh, piece of data. An interesting one that came up was Microsoft Edge was uh, considering our site to be uh, have suspicious content. Uh, we discovered that uh, this was in week two as well, and this was when we used a URL that was uh, a, a, a standard static website URL for blob storage. So if you're familiar with Azure static sites, you'll know that when you enable it on a, on a, on a storage account, uh, the URL that you get is like the name of the storage account dot web dot z26 which is like the region that you're in dot something something and i think because of that relatively complex url microsoft edge thought that it could have been suspicious so we changed that to be an m365may.com account uh sorry uh, m365may.com domain uh, and that seemed to resolve the issue combined with the JavaScript embed approach that we did, did those both at the same time and suddenly our suspicious site flag went away. As a web developer, always one of the challenges that we have is Internet Explorer 11. So um, I, I, I wish we didn't have to support Internet Explorer version 11, but we do. Uh, and uh, there's always uh, some what are called polyfills, particularly from a JavaScript perspective. It's such an old browser that you need to fill in some gaps with uh, Internet Explorer 11 uh, that uh, were problematic. Uh, but luckily, the open source community offers these uh, polyfills and makes it uh, easier to, to in, in incorporate um, compatibility backwards. And redundancy that was the last one, that the last challenge I wanted to mention, and that's really around uh, making sure that uh, we're not isolated to a single host. So um, we've actually got five uh, Azure Function apps dispersed around, uh, geolocated um, around the world, around the globe, and that's um, that's important because we wanted to make sure that if you know one data center goes down, or if for whatever reason a storage account goes a bit funny. Um, which doesn't happen often, but in case it does, we still want it to be operational and, and have an opportunity to, to fail over where necessary. So they're the main challenges that we dealt with. I do want to talk about Azure service, the Azure services and what the platform look like in the end, but I do uh, note that we are kind of getting to the end of our allocated time, and I know we wanted to sort of uh, uh, conclude on sort of the, like, while this is about technology, uh, we do want to sort of bring it back to what this actually meant for the community. So um, perhaps, Lorian, is, is there uh, any sort of thoughts to, to this approach or this, um, uh, this the way that this was delivered that you can offer there? Um, look, I think the, the main thing was that the focus was around simplifying the end user experience, um, both for us as um, event organizers, as um, event speakers, as well as event attendees. And so while there's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes, ultimately what people really saw was just a fluid, simplified experience um, that was in front of them. 
Um, and that was the main thing. And uh, I'm not sure if you have a screenshot of the admin interface, but you know what Mark was referring to before was you know initially that um, working with some of this stuff was really challenging for us. And then yeah, having this in, uh, admin interface just really set the bar so high um, for this, just made it so much easier for us to work with. Yeah, there's um, we d we did have a, a slide on the evolution of this, right? So uh, how we actually made it work through the the uh, the delivery of this solution, um, which I've just put up now, which is uh, because I, I think in t it was about two weeks before um, May that we started talking seriously about the solution and what it would look like. So I had basically two weeks to to come up with this this solution. And as a consequence, through the, I focused on the things that were important to uh, users to get on to the sessions that they want to get onto. But we had to do some work, obviously, to make this uh, easier behind the scenes. And um, and as you say, the first the first week we 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 made it work with spreadsheets, right? Like we're we're working with a um, in, in Teams, oddly enough, uh, had a spreadsheet, and every session would have a, a series of URLs. And on a daily basis, I'd go in and make sure all the links were correct in the system and all that sort of thing, because it takes time to build an admin interface, right? Uh, it takes time to make it make sure it's um, it, it works across uh, multiple nodes and that sort of thing. Uh, so we we slowly evolved this solution behind the scenes, which hopefully didn't you didn't see as uh, attendees uh, change that much, but it it uh, definitely. Uh, you know, from week two, for example, we gave uh, storage access, uh, table storage access to the Azure table, uh, the storage account, uh, and that made it a little easier, although it's quite difficult to interact with table storage uh, directly. Uh, but week three was where it came to being, right? The admin interface was was kind of the, you know, we had authentication, we had um, uh, a user interface built on the Fluent Fabric uh, uh, framework and uh, that made uh, a lot of difference in terms of the way that um, uh, the solution could be uh, shared across multiple multiple people or the, the use of it could be shared across multiple people and uh, the point i guess from there was week four is basically running itself right i mean it, <laughs> from a from my perspective I, I didn't have to do very much in the last week uh, <laughs> apart from actually attending sessions which was great uh, I, I, and I'm sure, um, Lauren, you can you can speak to that as well. That that there was an element to this that uh, once we built up a community of people, both uh, supporting uh, the people, the speakers, uh, but also supporting the back end uh, operation of it as well. Uh, we 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 basically had a, a an event that that just worked. Yeah, absolutely. It became a lot simpler um, and a lot more automated. So uh, yes, the last week has been relatively smooth sailing. Um, so yeah, it's good to have had that experience right at the end. <laughs> yeah, if, I, if only we could start again now, right? Yeah, yeah let's let's do it in 55 June. <laughs> I guess that's, that's important, isn't it? Because it is all about community. I, I guess the reason for this uh, event is uh, to to make you know, uh, and if we go back to the numbers, like over a hundred speakers, uh, you know, thousands of of attendees, uh, you know, all gaining insight and benefit from from knowledge sharing and all the rest of it. I think that's really important to to think about, and that's definitely from my point of view, is what drove drove me to develop this solution as well. So Mark, it looks like we've come to time and that Laurie's been doing a great job looking at the Q&A as we've been going along and answering people's questions. I'm just checking to see if there's any more that's come in, but given we're at time and he's answered everything, did you want to want to wrap it up? Yeah, well, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, I think it's been, a, uh, as I say, it's been a great opportunity to, uh, to get involved in the community and uh, I thank the Microsoft 365 May team to to allow me to do that. It's been uh, great having you involved and um, thank you everyone who's attended the session today and everyone who will be watching it when we publish it later on. Yeah, no worries. Cheers, great, thanks for that. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. day. Yeah. Bye.